All right, so apologies for missing last time's uh, setting or, um, or video. Uh, unfortunately, the recording utterly borked. Um, it had a reverb effect the entire way through. I don't know the source of it, but all I do know is that I could not figure out how to fix it and I had no real interest in doing so. We did learn some interesting stuff though, so I will, as usual, give the recap slash report of it, of the things that were pertinent to us. A lot of the struggle with this text is that it is very much of its time. It's not historicizing, it is specifically talking about things that were happening at that particular time to people who were aware of and constantly reading the news about consider today's conflicts um wherein every couple of days there's there's a dozen different um competing groups that are going and doing their own different thing and then splitting and then combining and so on and so forth it happens in these sorts of things um so from Marx's perspective at the time, all these names are household names. For us, it's not the case. When he brings up the fact that um, Italy was having a revivalism of the Roman Republic, um, for example, um, yeah, I had no clue that was a thing, but apparently it is. That said, though... Um, we did get some interesting and useful things out there. Continuing on, in addition to that, is the uh, examples of the modern-day bourgeois state utilizing the exact same tactics to maintain the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie over the proletariat as t nearly 200 years ago as they do now. There's, there's really no change. It's, it's just kind of repackaged a little. Sometimes, not even often. Um, but there's also some additional little tidbits as well, um, both that were historically pertinent and, and potentially pertinent now. So, for our report, um, one of the things that the Mark says is he references things called workers' clubs. Um, he he calls them gathering points of conspiratorial seats of the revolutionary proletariat. Um, this would be similar in their own right to the bourgeois revolutionary places of um, the coffee shops, wherein during the aristocracy, uh, during the bourgeois revolutions against the aristocracy, the places that the um, bourgeoisie or, or the revolutionaries at the time met were in these coffee shops and they would discuss um, essentially, hey, you know, maybe the monarchy isn't so cool. <laughs> um, and they became grounds for organizing the um, various revolutionary movements. Um, but Marx references these worker clubs instead, which developed out of the workhouses um, which were the busy work that was forced upon the working class um, in order to keep them from going beyond that while also um, screwing with the conception of, um, you know, everybody should be able to have a job, um, freedom of employment. Um, excuse me. So... Marx references these workers' clubs as a coalition of the whole working class against the whole bourgeois class and as the formation of the workers' state. This right here is the birthplace, the, the development of what we might call dual power um, out of Lenin, with the development of the proletarian state within the shell of the bourgeois one. Marx also gives description in his own right, of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, or at least what we would call it. 
he describes it ultimately as an organic order which adheres to legal formalism only until that formalism threatens the bourgeois order, at which point it is immediately abandoned. Only associations which harmonize with the ruling class are accepted. This applies to the dictatorship of the proletariat as well. It will be an organic order that has a legal function, but ultimately that legal function is interpreted through the lens of whatever is maintains the dictatorship of the proletariat, the absolute authority of proletarian class interests. So, um, on that note, um, the, there are also yet more examples we can take to modern day tactics by the bourgeoisie to fight against any sort of proletarian organizing. These include, um, as listed, legal formalism uses a shield for the bourgeoisie until it's in conflict with its interests, forcing the proletariat to maneuver through those formalisms while the bourgeoisie do not or the legal formalism fully serves them and we have no formal way of achieving what we desire um, and this just goes to show the complete inability for any sort of um, reformism to actually transcend and or any sort of evolutionary socialism or whatever they like to call it these days the next, the maintaining of a profoundly unpopular order by the opposition so the opposition does not fall apart. It only holds itself together through having something it disagrees with. See Biden or Pelosi, etc. saying that they want a, quote, strong Republican Party. These are words straight out of their mouth. They do not want to win. They want to forever hold their opposition, their odious opposition, as the reason they can't do anything. Losing that opposition would mean that they would have to make do on their promises. And they can't do that. They won't do that. Um, and third, trying to draw socialists within the bourgeois party or in an unequal alliance with them, putting socialists behind rather than leading the revolutionary movement, thus removing all capacity of the socialists to actually develop. This is a con, this is a consistent thing. This is entryism in a nutshell. Um, yeah, don't do this. Again, these sorts of tactics are in use. Understand how to identify them. Learn from the history of class struggle. And build up what is necessary to avoid having a mass of workers that fall for these tricks over and over and over again. The reason that they keep working is because people aren't learning from their history. <laughs> um, or they're in a material condition wherein they have no choice to, because guess what? There's no alternative out there, right? However often, you know. Well, uh, I might as well vote uh, blue because, you know, there's no socialist party out there. That's a problem. Why isn't there a socialist party out there? Think on that for a moment. Continuing. Also an interesting tidbit. Um, this is potentially tactically um, useful for us. Um, at the time, the workers had a furist the utopian, uh, commune, and could potentially join in the revolutionary movement, but only if the revolutionary bourgeois faction actually committed. And they saw the possibility of pushing it beyond a pay bourgeois aim set for that revolutionary movement. In other words, they decided to fence it until the um, revolutionary bourgeoisie, which existed at the time, the aristocracy was still around, actually got into actual fisticuffs then on their own terms they could join the fight and fight everybody so let us um continue where we left off um we are part way through um section three which is the consequences of june 13 1849 
Okay. The second period in the life of the Constitutional Republic, its royalist period of sowing wild oats, closes with the recess of the Legislative Assembly. The state of siege in Paris had again been raised. The activities of the press had again begun. During the suspension of the Social Democratic Papers, during the period of the repressive legislation and royalist bluster, the Sikil, the old literary representative of the monarchist constitutional petty bourgeois, republicanized itself. The press, the old literary exponent of the bourgeois reformers, democratized itself. While the national, the old classical organ of the republican bourgeois, socialized itself. This is the movement of, you know, uh, we might call this the um, political, um, not compass, but the Overton window. The secret societies grew in extent and intensity in the same degree that the public clubs became impossible. The workers' industrial cooperatives, tolerated as purely commercial societies, while no count economically became politically so many means of cementing the proletariat. June 13 had struck off the official head of the various semi-revolutionary parties. The masses that remained won a head of their own. The Knights of Order had practiced intimidation by prophecies of the terror of the Red Republic, the base excesses, the hyperborean atrocities of the victorious counter-revolution in Hungary, in Baden, in Rome, washed the Red Republic white. They're literally threatening people, if you have your socialist revolution, then the counter-revolution will brutally murder all of you. So sit down and shut the fuck up. And a malcontent intermediate classes of French society began to prefer the promises of the Red Republic with its problematic terrors of the uh, terrors to the terrors of the Red Monarchy with its actual hopelessness. No socialist in France spread more revolutionary propaganda than Hanya. To each man a town according to his work. I don't know what Han Hainal is. Um Austria, ah, yes, an Austrian general who suppressed insurrectionary movements in Italy and Hungary. Um, so essentially, you know, um, looking at what he was doing, um, and the intensity of the, um, of the oppression, um, it actually propagandized as part of a blowback effect. Um, but right here, the... D-O-T-P. We have these clubs that became secret societies um, because, you know, the clubs are made illegal. Um, and in addition to workers' industrial cooperatives, um, became organs of political organization as well. And then, um, it's right here, um, more tactics by Uchwazi. And we do see this, right? They, they threaten us. Oh, you know what happened in Venezuela, right? It's like, what? Who created Venezuela the way it is? You guys fucking wrecked it. You embargoed it and everything. How is this a threat against socialism? It's a threat against... It, it's you threatening us. Fuck you. <laughs> In the meantime, Louis Bonaparte exploited the recess of the National Assembly to make princely tours of the provinces. The most hot-blooded legimists made pilgrimages to Ems. The, to the grandchildren of the Saint de Louis, and a mass of popular representatives on the side of order and treat in the department councils, which had just met. It was necessary to make them pronounce what the majority of the National Assembly did not yet dare pronounce, an urgent motion for immediate revision of the Constitution. According to the Constitution, it could not be revised before 1852, and then only by a National Assembly called together expressly for this purpose. 
If, however, the majority of the department councils expressed themselves his effect, was not the National Assembly bound to sacrifice the virginity of the Constitution to the voice of France? The National Assembly entertained the same hopes in regard to the provincial assemblies as the nuns in Voltaire's Henraid entertained in regard to the Pandors. I have no idea what any of that is, but I assume he's making a joke. <laughs> um, in regards to the fact that the Constitution has just been completely ignored time and time again. Um, and they're only making a deal about, um, a deal about it now because it happens to put it in the hands of the people to some degree. But some exceptions apart, the Potiphar's of the National Assembly had to deal with just so many Josephs of the provinces. The vast majority of you did not want to understand the importunate insinuation. The vi revision of the Constitution was frustrated by the very instruments which were to have called it into being, by the votes of the department councils. The voice of France, and indeed of bourgeois France, had spoken and spoken against revision. At the beginning of October, the Legislative National Assembly met once more. Um, and there's a footnote here um, to a bunch of, I assume, Latin. That And the footnote says, how great the change since then. Um, uh, that's a need. Um, gotcha. Its physiognomy was completely changed. The unexpected rejection of revision on the part of the department councils had put it back within the limits of the constitution and indicated the limits of its term of life. The Orleanists had become mistrustful because of the pilgrimages of the Legimus to Ems. The Legimus had grown suspicious because of the Orleanists' negotiations with London. The journals of the two factions had fanned the fire and weighed the reciprocal claims of their pretenders. Orleanists and Legimists grumbled in unison at the machinations of the Bonapartists, which showed themselves in the princely tours and in more or less transparent emancipatory attempts of the present in the presumptuous language of the Bonapartist newspapers. Louis Bonaparte grumbled at the National Assembly, which found only the Legimus Orleanist conspiracy legitimate, at a ministry which betrayed him continually to this National Assembly. Finally, the ministry was divided on the Roman policy and on the income tax proposed by Minister Passy, decried as socialistic by the conservatives. How very usual. <laughs> um, one of the first bills of the Barat ministry in the reassembled legislative assembly was a demand for a credit of 300,000 francs, for the payment of a win widow's pension to the Duchess of Orleans. The National Assembly granted it and added it to the list of debts uh, the f of the French nation a sum of 7 million francs. Thus, while Louis Philippe continued to play successfully the role of Pavur Hontex, the shamefaced beggar, the ministry dared not move a an increase of salary for Bonaparte, nor did the Assembly appear inclined to grant it. And Louis Bonaparte, as ever, vacillated in the dilemma. Ot Caesar ot Clichy. Um, and that is either Caesar or Clichy. Clichy was a debtor's prison in Paris. <laughs> okay. Either Bonaparte would have to become Caesar and cross the Rubicon or go into debtor's prison. I, I think. I, I'm not sure. The minister's second demand for a credit, one of nine million francs for the costs of the Rome expedition, increased the tension between Bonaparte on the one hand and the ministers and the National Assembly on the other. Louis Bonaparte had inserted a letter to his military aide, Edgar Ney, in the Monitor, in which he had bound the papal government to constitutional guarantees. The Pope, on his part, had published an address, Muto Proprio, in which he rejected any limitation to his restored rule. And there is a footnote here saying, Muto proprio of his own motion, 
initial words of a special kind of papal encyclical adopted without the preliminary approval of the cardinals, and usually concerning the internal political and administrative affairs of the papal states. Here this refers to the statement of Pope Pius IX to my beloved subjects of September 12, 1849. Back to the text. In which Bonaparte's letter, with studied and discretion, raised the curtain of his cabinet in order to expose himself to the eyes of the gallery as a benevolent genius who was, however, misunderstood and shackled in his own house. It was not the first time that he had co cocaded with the furtive lights of the free soul, quote unquote, um, with a um, footnote from George Herweg from the mountains. Hearers, the reporter of the commission, completely ignored Bonaparte's flight and contented himself with translating the papal allocution into French. It was not the ministry, but Victor Hugo, who sought to save the president through the order of the day in which the National Assembly was to express its agreement with Napoleon's letter. Allez donc, allez donc, let's go then. With this disrespectful, frivolous interjection, the majority buried Hugo's motion. The policy of the president, the letter of the president, the president himself. Uh, let's go then, let's go then. Who the devil takes Monsieur, Monsieur Bonaparte seriously? Do you believe, Monsieur Victor Hugo, that we believe you that you believe in the president? Let's go then, let's go then. So Victor Hugo, he's the guy who wrote Le, Le, Le Mis, right? Yeah, Hunchback in Notre Dame and Le Mis. Interesting. I didn't know that he was in politics. Um, I suppose that makes sense. So, Le Mis is actually describing this. Okay. All right. Um, I, I guess I should probably take another look at at least a movie. I know it's a very different than book. Um, but still. <clears throat> Continuing. Finally, the breach between Bonaparte and the National Assembly was hastened by the discussion on the recall of the Orleans and the Bourbons. In default of the ministry, the president's cousin, Joseph Bonaparte, son of the ex-king of Westphalia, had put forward this motion, which had no other purpose than to push the legitimate and the Orleanist pretenders down to the same level, or rather a lower level than the Bonapartist pretender, who at least stood in fa fact at the pinnacle of the state. Napoleon Bonaparte was disrespectful enough to make the recall of the expelled royal families and the amnesty of the June insurgents part of one and the same motion. The indignation of the majority compelled him to apologize immediately for this sacrilegious concatenation of the holy and the impious, of the royal races and the proletarian brood, of the fixed stars of society and of its swamp lights and to assign each of the two motions to its proper place. The majority energetically rejected the recall of the royal family, the barrier, the Demosthenes of the legitimists, have no doubt about the meaning of the vote, the civic degradation of the pretenders, that is what is intended. It is desired to rob them of their halo, of the last majority that is left to them, the majesty of exile. What, cried Barrier, would the pretender sink of the present, who, forgetting his august origin, came here to live as a simple private individual? It could not have been more clearly intimated to Louis Bonaparte that he had not gained a day by his presence, that whereas the royalists and coalition needed him here in France as a, quote, neutral man in the presidential chair, the serious pretender to its throne had to be kept out of profane sight by the fog of exile. On November 1st, Louis Bonaparte answered the Legislative Assembly with a message which, in quite brusque words, announced the dismissal of the Barat Ministry and the formation of a new ministry, the Barat Falu Ministry and the Ministry of the Royalist Coalition. The Hot Pool, Pool Ministry was a ministry of Bonaparte, the organ of the President as against the Legislative Assembly, the Ministry of the Clerks. Bonaparte was no longer the merely neutral man of December 10, 1848. 
His possession of the executive power had grouped a group number of interests around him. The struggle with anarchy forced a party of order itself to increase his influence, and he was no longer popular. The party of order excuse me, was unpopular. Could he not hope to compel the Orleanists and the Legimists, through their rivalry as well as through the necessity of some sort of monarchist restoration, to recognize a natural pretender, the neutral pretender? For November 1st, 1849, dates of the third period in the life of the Constitutional Republic, a period which closes with March 10th, 1850. The regular game, so much admired by Guizot of the constitutional institutions, the wrangling between executive and legislative power now begins. More as against a hankering for restoration on the part of the United Orleanists and Legitimists, Bonaparte defends his title to his actual power, the Republic. As against a hankering for restoration on the part of Bonaparte, the party of order defends its title to a common rule, the Republic. As against the Orleanists, the Legimists, and against the Legimists, the Orleanists, defend the status quo, the Republic. All these factions of the party of order, each of which has its own king and its own restoration in petto, secretly, mutually enforce, as against their rivals hankering for usurpation revolt, the common rule of the bourgeoisie, the form which the special claims remain neutralized and reserve the Republic. In other words, these are all just different factions of the bourgeoisie. They have their own kings, they've got their own focuses, but ultimately they are all on the same side. Any amount of competition between them is, from our perspective, illusory. They're all aiming to the same thing. They just have their quibbles along the way. Just as Kant makes a republic, so these royalists make the monarchy, the only rational form of state, a postulate of practical reason whose realization is never attained, but whose attainment must always be striven for and mentally adhered to as a goal. Isn't that... Isn't that familiar? Just replace royal monarchy with... Liberal democracy. <laughs> oh gosh. Thus, the constitutional republic had gone forth from the hands of the bourgeois republicans as a hollow, hollow ideological formula to become form full of content and life in the hands of the royals in coalition. And Tyr spoke more truly than he suspects when he said, we, the royalists, are the true pillars of the constitutional republic. <laughs> the overthrow of the ministry of the coalition and the appearance of the ministry of the clerks has a second significance. Its finance minister was fold. Fold, as finance minister, signifies the official surrender of France's national wealth to the bourse, the management of the state's property by the bourse and the interests of the bourse. With the nomination of Fold, the finance aristocracy announced its restoration in the monitor. This restoration necessarily supplemented the other restorations, which formed just so many links in the chain of the constitutional republic. Louis Philippe had never dared to make the genuine Loup Severe, stock exchange wolf, finance minister. Just as his monarchy was the ideal name for the rule of the big bourgeoisie, so in his ministries the privileged interests had to bear ideologically disinterested names. The bourgeois republic everywhere pushed into the forefront what the different monarchies, Legimists as well as Orleanists, had kept concealed in the background. It made earthly what they had made heavenly. In place of the names of the saints, it put the bourgeois proper names of the dominant class interests. Our whole exposition has shown how the Republic, from the first days of existence, its existence, did not overthrow, but consolidated the finance aristocracy. But the concessions made to it were a fate to which submission was made without the desire to bring it about. With Fold, the initiative in the government returned to the finance aristocracy. The question will now be asked the question will be asked how the coalesced bourgeoisie could bear and suffer the rule of finance, 
on which under Louis Philippe depended on the exclusion or subordination of the remaining bourgeois factions? The answer is simple. First of all, the finance aristocracy itself forms a weighty authoritative part of the royalist coalition, whose common governmental power is the denominated republic. Are not the spokesmen and the leading lights along the Orleanists, the old confederates and the complices of the finance aristocracy? Is not itself the golden phalanx of Orleanism? As far as the legitimates are concerned, under Louis Philippe, they had already participated and practiced in all the orgies of the bourse, mine, and railway speculations. In general, the combination of large landed property with high finance is a normal fact, proof England, proof even Austria. In a country like France, where the volume of national production stands at a disproportionately lower level than the amount of the national debt, where government bonds form the most important subject of speculation, and the worst chief market for the investment of capital that wants to turn itself to account in the most unproductive way. In such a country, a countless number of people from all bourgeois or semi-bourgeois classes must have an interest in the state debt, in the burst gambling, say in finance. Do not all these interests subalterns find their natural mainstays and commanders in the faction which represents its interest in its vastest, vastest outlines, which represent it as a whole? In other words, you know, the revolution, the bourgeois revolution, you know, it supported the elites. That, and those elites, you know, they happen to be... Um, the middle class within the aristocracy but ultimately they were still elites they're the one they they were the five percenters the ten percenters um compared to the peasantry and stuff these people were in tight with the finance aristocracy a lot of their wealth rested upon the finance aristocracy um because you know they bought land too they required land in order to um go in and pop down factories. These things, in order to gain access to these things, they relied on the financial aristocracy. Um, in addition um, to that, you know, these people who went into the new bourgeois state, they were intimately engaged with it. They, um, they protected the finance aristocracy. Um, they never went in and actually purged these elements. They, they went in and saved them, in fact. In addition, you know, finance aristocracy is very lucrative. So what are these bourgeois elements going to do? Are they going to get rid of a lucrative um, area with which to make money? No. They want to get involved. They want to get in. Their revolution is not, it, it, it is putting themselves on top, but it's also rescuing these other elements and bring them into the new order so that they can get a piece of the pie as well. Continuing, what conditions the accrual of state property to high finance, the constantly growing indebtedness of the state, and the indebtedness of the state? The constant excess of its expenditure over its income, a disproportion which is simultaneously the cause and effect of state of the system of state loans. In order to escape from this indebtedness, the state must either restrict its expenditure, that is, simplify and curtail the government organism, govern as little as possible, employ as few personnel as possible, enter as little as possible into relations of, with bourgeois society. This path was impossible for the party of order. Which, whose means of repression, official interference in the name of the state, and ubiquity through the organs of the state were bound to increase in the same measure as the number of quarters increase, from which its rule and the conditions for its existence of its class are threatened. The gendarmerie cannot be reduced in the same measure as a tax on persons and property increase. This is how I would describe l neoliberalism. Um, you know, we need austerity in order to control the national debt, right? But guess what? 
as we take away all these supports for people, all the hard, long one um, reforms, and the only way that's going to fly is by building up intense state repression of people who are complaining about the fact that suddenly they don't have all these necessities because, you know, their wages have been cut. They've lost their um, very social democratic reforms, um, so on and so forth. So when neoliberalism claims, oh, we're small government, no, they're not. They're for very, very big government. It's just that they've realized that in order to protect private property, they have to kill everybody who is against private property. They have to imprison them. They have to repress them. We have cops on the street in America who get military training at giant complexes that do freaking um, urban warfare training. And then, you know, they go around in what amounts to miniature tanks while they have full soldier level body armor they're so kitted out it's ridiculous they they look ridiculous um with full body armor and automatic weapons like these this is a militarized occupation force the the police are not you know there to protect you they're there to occupy you Yes, Leonides, this would be the, um, it's not just one, there's multiple, but the focus is on this one. It's uh, Cop City, as it's called, and it just so happens to be in a place that is in a high um, African-American area. And it will also chop down a large state park which is necessary for a variety of things, but not including, not, not limited to um, keeping, you know, that black neighborhood from being flooded constantly because it's in a floodplain without, the, um, without that forest absorbing it. Um, so yeah, urban warfare for police in America what could that possibly mean? What? What? <laughs> okay, continuing. Or the state must seek to evade the debts and produce an immediate but transitory balance in its budget by putting extraordinary taxes on the shoulders of the wealthiest classes. But was a party of order to sacrifice its own wealth on the altar of the fatherland to stop the national wealth from being exploited by the bourse? Not so stupid. Therefore, without a complete revolution in the French state, no revolution in the state budget. Along with this state budget necessarily goes the lordship of the trade in state debts, of the state creditors, the bankers, the money dealers, and the wolves of the bourse. Only one faction of the party of order was directly concerned in the overthrow of the finance aristocracy. The manufacturers. We are not speaking of the mill, of the smaller people engaged in industry. We are speaking of the reigning princes in the manufacturing interests, who had formed the broad basis of the dynastic opposition under Louis Philippe. Their interest is indubitably reduction of the costs of production, and hence reduction of the taxes, which enter into production and hence reduction of the state debts, the interest on which enters into the taxes, and hence the overthrow of the finance aristocracy. In England, and the largest French manufacturers are petty bourgeois compared with their English rivals, actually find the manufacturers, a Codbrin, a Bright, at the head of the crusade against the bank and the stock, stock exchange aristocracy. Why not in France? In England, industry predominates. In France, agriculture. In England, industry requires free trade. In France, protective tariffs, national monopoly alongside other monopolies. French industry does not dominate French production. The French industrialists, therefore, do not dominate the French bourgeoisie. 
in order to secure the advancements of their interests as against the remaining factions of the bourgeoisie. They cannot, like the English, take the lead of the movement and simultaneously push their interests to the fore. They must follow in the train of the revolution and serve interests which they are opposed to the collective interests of their class. In February, they had misunderstood their position. February sharpened their wits. And who is more directly threatened by the workers than the employer, the industrial capitalists? The manufacturer, therefore, of necessity became in France the most fanatical member of the party of order. The reduction of his profit by finance, what is that compared with the abolition of profit by the proletariat? Right. Um, uh, there's something I wanted to say here. I'm trying to remember what it was suddenly. Oh, yes. Um, the main thrust of classical economics was identifying what constitute as productive or unproductive. Now, Marx, he is a classical economist, but what he understands as productive is quite distinct from um, previous classical economists' notions of productive and unproductive. Marx's understanding of productive has to do with something that reproduces society um and in capitalism you know the work of the capitalists is actually productive because they are involved in reproducing the capitalist order um by a socialist definition in in those terms within a socialist state any kind of labor capitalist does is of course unproductive but it, that that is besides the point um but the reason for this thrust was because the um, the classical economists were tackling ideologically and um, within the intellectual labor of analyzing the mode of production, that is to say economics, the conception of um, the aristocracy, the landowners. Um, and people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo argued that, you know, land ownership and landlordism and rentier and so on and so forth is fundamentally unproductive and a massive fetter on the wealth of, of nations and on society as a whole. This is all entirely correct, of course. Um, taxes are a fetter on the development of the capitalist mode of production. This is obvious, right? However, to make note, all these all these classical economists understand that it's not so simple as private individuals going in and doing this stuff, right? That's why Adam Smith advocates for, for example, free education, development of roads and transport industry, and all these other things that are classically understood to be best done by the state. And the reason for this is because he is in principally interested in the prices of production and reducing as much as possible, removing as many fetters on the development of the productive forces as possible, and removing as many fetters on um, private business as possible. If you are a private businessman and you are trying to make it big, the costs of actually getting into production are very high if you're having to do stuff like pay tolls for your roads by your competitors because, you know, your roads are owned by a private company that is wanting to get money out of you or taxation and so on and so forth, right? So there are very particular things that classical economics of so the Smithian and Ricardian and whatnot is in, is in support of and other things that it's not. Um, most libertarians and classical liberals, though, they don't really have any conception of such a thing. Um, Marx was the capstone of classical economics, of course. Um, 
after Marx came in and utilized the very same analysis that the classical economics economists did, improved it, turned it on the capitalist mode of production itself, and resulted in communism, you know, no other economists could grapple with him on the grounds of classical economics. And so there's an intellectual counter-revolution, and then we get this weird neoclassical economics, which is nonsense. It's it's all about denying that value exists. It's all about looking into the weeds. It doesn't really... Oh, Radhika Desai has a thing. I linked it before, um, and I won't go into too much depth about it, but fundamentally, there's just no response to Marx from the classical sphere. That's why he's the capstone of it. Okay, continuing the text. In France, the pay bourgeois does what normally the industrial bourgeois would have to do. The worker does what normally would be the task of the pay bourgeois. The task of the worker. Who accomplishes that? No one. In France, it is not accomplished. In France, it is proclaimed. It is not accomplished anywhere within the national boundaries. Um, and there is a footnote. The proposition that the proletarian revolution could only be victorious in several advanced capitalist countries simultaneously and not in a single country alone was most clearly formulated by Engels in his work Principles of Communism, 1847. By developing further the Marxist theory and drawing on the law of uneven economic and political development of capitalism in the era of imperialism, in 1915 Lin came to a conclusion that under new historical conditions, the victory of the socialist revolution would be possible initially in a few or even a, even a single country. This is socialism in one country. The class war within French society to, turns into a world war in which the nations confront one another. The accomplishment begins only at the moment when, through the world war, the proletary is pushed to the fore of the people that dominate the whole the world, the world market, to the forefront in England. The revolution, which finds here not its end, but its organizational beginning, is no short-lived revolution. The present generation is like the Jews who Moses led through the wilderness. It is not only has not only has a new world to conquer; it must go under in order to make room for the men who are able to cope with the new world. Let us return to fold. On November 14, 1849, Fold mounted the Tribune of the National Assembly and expounded his system of finance. An apology for the old system of taxes, retention of the wine tax, abandonment of Passy's income tax. Passy, too, was no revolutionist. He was an old minister of Louis Philippe's. He belonged to the Puritans of the Dufar brand and was into the most intimate confidants of Teste. Footnote. Um, by Engels, the 1895 edition, on July 8th, 1847, before the Chamber of Peers in Paris began, began the trial of Armentier and Jean Cubiers for bribery of officials with a view to obtaining a salt worker, salt works concession and of the then Minister of Public Works test for accepting such money bribes. The latter during the trial attempted to commit suicide. All were sentenced to pay heavy fines, tests in addition to three years imprisonment. Um, the scapegoat of the July monarchy, uh, who was test. Passy had too had praised the old tax system and recommended the retention of the wine tax, but he had to say he had at the same time torn the veil from the state deficit. He had declared a necessity for a new tax, the income tax, and the bankruptcy of the state was to be avoided. Fold, who had recommended state bankruptcy to Le Drouillin, recommended the state deficit to the Legislative Assembly. He promised economies, the secret of which later revealed itself in that, for example, expenditures diminished by 60 millions, while the floating debt increased by 200 millions. 
conjures tricks and the grouping of figures and the drawing up of accounts, which all finally mounted to new loans. Among the other gentlemen, <laughs> isn't this, isn't this, uh, <laughs> isn't this familiar? The old tricks. But these tricks are, you know, they're useful for the people who are getting rich off them and they're not getting punished. So why would they do anything different? Alongside the other jealous bourgeois factions, the finance aristocracy naturally did not act in so shamelessly corrupt a manner under fooled as an under Louis Philippe. But once it existed, the system remained the same. Constant increase in the debts, masking of the deficit. And in time, the old bourse swindling came out more openly. Proof, the law considering the Avignon Railway. The mysterious fluctuations in government securities. For a brief time, the topic of the day throughout Paris. Finally, the ill-starred speculation of uh, Phil Fold and Bonaparte on the elections of March 10th. With the official restoration of the finance aristocracy, the French people soon had to stand again before February 24. The Constituent Assembly, an attack on misanthropy against its heir, had abolished the wine tax for the year of our Lord 1850. New debts could not be paid with the abolition of old taxes. Cretan, a Cretan of the Party of Order, had moved the retention of the wine tax even, even before the Legislative Assembly recessed. Fold took up this motion in the name of the Bonapartist ministry, and on December 20th, 1849, the anniversary of the day Bonaparte was proclaimed president, the National Assembly decreed the restoration of the wine tax. The sponsor of this restoration was not a financier. It was a Jesuit chief, Mon Montalbert. His argument was strikingly simple. Taxation is a maternal breast on which a government is suckled. The government is the instrument of repression. It is the organs of authority. It is the army. It is the police. It is the officials, the judges, the ministers, and it is the priests. An attack on taxation is an attack by the anarchists on the simple sentinels of order who safeguard the material and spiritual production of bourgeois society from the inroads of the proletarian vandals. Taxation is the fifth god, side by side with property, the family, order, and religion. The wine tax is incontestably taxation and moreover, not ordinary, but traditional, monarchically disposed, respectable taxation. Long live the tax on drinks. Three cheers and one cheer more. This is a great, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a great quote. <laughs> When the French peasant paints the devil, he paints him in the guise of a tax collector. From the moment when Montal Lambert elevated taxation to a god, the peasant became, became godless, atheist, and threw himself into the arms of the devil of socialism. The religion of order had forfeited him. The Jesuits had forfeited him. Bonaparte had forfeited him. On December 20th, 1849, had irrevocable irrevocably compromised December 20th, 1848. The, quote, nephew of his uncle was not the first of his family whom, with whom the wine tax defeated, a tax which, in Montalembert's phrase, heralds a new revolutionary storm. The real, the great Napoleon declared on St. Helena that the reintroduction to the wine tax had contributed more to his downfall than all else since it had alienated him from the peasants of southern France. As far back as under Louis the sixth, the fourteenth, the favorite object of hatred of the people, see the writings of Bois Guilbert and Vauban, abolished by the first revolution, it was reintroduced by Napoleon in the modified form of the eight, in eighteen o eight. When the restoration entered France, there trotted out before not only the Cossacks but also the promises to abolish the wine tax. The gentry naturally did not need to keep its word to the pe people pity taxes tax piteously. The year 1830 promised the abolition of the wine tax. It was not its way to do what it said or say what it did. The year 1848 promised the abolition of the wine tax just as it promised everything. Finally, the constituent assembly, which promised nothing, 
made, as already mentioned, a testamentary provision whereby the tax wine tax was to disappear on January 1st, 1850. And just 10 days before January 1st, 1850, the Legislative Assembly introduced it once more so that the French people perpetually pursued it and when they had thrown it out the door, saw it come again through the window. Isn't that familiar? <laughs> Um, this is also a pretty fucking good quote here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is common. Um, th this is a common thing to happen. So it's like, um, and it keeps on working, right? Uh, when the Republican Party promises to the religious right, oh yes, we will certainly um, abolish or br bring back prayer in the classrooms. Or, you know, if you don't vote us in, if you don't vote blue no matter who, then, oh man, uh, we won't be able to keep abortion rights in place, right? So you better vote for us. It's like, well, why didn't you just, you know, enshrine it when you had the chance? You had a bunch of chances. You had 40 years of chances. Why didn't you? I'll tell you why. Because it was useful. It was a bargaining chip. You don't throw your chips away. You don't cash them in. You keep on betting with them. That's the way that you chase your losses. The popular hatred of the wine tax is explained by the fact that it unites in itself all the odiousness of the French system of taxation. The mode of its collection is odious, the mode of its distribution aristocratic, for the rates of taxation are the same for the commonest as for the costliest wines. It increases, therefore, in geometric progression as the wealth of the consumer decreases, an inverted progressive tax. It accordingly directly provokes the poisoning of the labor classes by putting a premium on adulterated and imitation wines. It lessens consumption, since it sets up toll houses before the gates of all towns of over 4,000 inhabitants and transforms each such town into a foreign country with a protective tariff against French wine. The big wine merchants, but still more the small ones, the merchants de vins, whose livelihood directly depends on the consumption of wine, are so many avowed enemies of the wine tax. And finally, by lessening consumption, the wine tax curtails a producer's market. While it renders the urban workers incapable of paying for wine, it renders the wine growers incapable of selling it. And France has a wine-growing population of about 12 million. One can therefore understand the hatred of the people in general, one can in particular understand the fanaticism of the peasants against the wine tax. In addition, they saw in its restoration no isolated, more or less accidental event. The peasants have a kind of historical tradition on their own, which is handed down from father to son. And in this, and in this historical school is muttered that whenever any government wants to dupe the peasants, it promises the abolition of the wine tax, and as soon as it is duped the peasants, it retains or reintroduces the wine tax. In the wine tax, the peasant tests the bouquet of the government, its tendency. The restoration of the wine tax on December 20th meant Louis Bonaparte is like the rest. But he was not like the rest. He was a peasant discovery, and in the petitions carrying millions of signatures against the wine tax, they took back the votes he had given a year before to the nephew of his uncle. The country folk, over two-thirds of the French population, consists for the most part of the so-called free landowners, the first generation, gratuitously freed by the revolution of 1789 for its feudal burdens, had paid no price for the soil. But the following generations paid under the form of the price of land, what their semi serf forefathers had paid for in the form of rent, tithes, corvee, etc. And more on the one hand, the population grew, and more on the other hand, the partition of the soil increased. The higher became the par price of the parcels, for the demand for them increased with their smallness. But in proportion, as the price the peasant paid for his parcel rose, 
whether he bought it directly or whether he had accounted it as capital by his co-heirs, necessarily the indebtedness of the peasant, that is, the mortgage, also rose. The claim to a debt encumbering the land is turned a mortgage, a pawn ticket in respect to the land. Just as privileges accumulated on the medieval estate, mortgages accumulated on the modern small allotment. On the other hand, under the system of parcelization, the soil is purely an instrument of production for its proprietor. Now, the fruitfulness of the land diminishes in the same measure as land is divided. The application of machinery to the land, the division of labor, major soil, improvement measures such as cutting drainage and irrigation canals and the like become more and more impossible, while the unproductive costs of cultivation increase in the same proportion as the division of the instrument of production itself. Okay, um, so, you know, this is pretty obvious, right? But if you're wanting to make land productive um, for agriculture, you need large amounts of it because you have to do wide scale um, irrigation and plant planting and stuff like that. But if you cut the land up into small and small pieces because private ownership of land is, you know, a thing, then it makes it very difficult to actually do that unless you got some really, really rich fucker who's bought hundreds or thousands of acres of land and, and, and who can do economies of scale with that land in terms of agriculture. So due to this privatization of land, it causes mass accumulation and makes vast stretches of land um, unproductive um, and increases inequalities in a twofold manner. One, it allows accumulation to take place in the first place. And two, land that is not accumulated by the big bourgeoisie becomes less productive because people have less access to it. It's not like the commons used to be. This is a pretty good discussion from the perspective of, you know... I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the um, so-called tragedy of the commons, which has been many years debunked and was entirely a bourgeois notion from the get-go. Um, in reality, it's not the tragedy of the commons. It's the tragedy of the private. Because it's actually only when privatization emerges that such a tragedy occurs. Uh, let me, I want to copy this. Um, uh, and I'm also going to dot, dot, dot. Um, These peasants are smarter than people nowadays, apparently, because they actually recognize um, <laughs> when they're being duped like this. Um, and then this little bit right here. Um, uh, da, da, da. Sorry about that. Got my quote. Okay, continuing. Now the fruitfulness of the land diminishes in the same measure as land is divided. The application of machinery to land, the division of labor, major soil, improvement measures such as cutting drainage and irrigation canals and the like become more and more impossible, while the unproductive costs of cultivation increase in the same proportion as the division of instrument of production itself. All this, regardless of whether the possessor of the small allotment possesses capital or not. But the more the division increases, the more does the parcel of land with its utterly wretched inventory for the entire capital of the small allotment peasant. 
The more does investment of capital and land diminish. The more does the peasant lack money, land, and education for making use of the progress in agronomy. And the more does the cultivation of the soil retrogress. Finally, the net proceeds diminish in the same proportion as the gross consumption increases, as the whole family of the peasant is kept back from the other occupations through its holding and not yet is not enabled to live by it. In the measure, therefore, that the population and, with it, the division of the land increases, does the instrument of production, the soil, become more expensive and its fertility decrease? Does agriculture decline and the peasant become loaded with debt? And what was the debt effect it becomes in its turn to cause? Each generation leaves behind another more deeply in debt. Each generation begins under more unfavorable and more aggravating conditions. Mortgaging begets mortgaging, and when it becomes impossible for the peasant to offer his small holding as security for new debts, that is, to encumber it with new mortgages, he falls in direct victim to usury, and usurious interest rates become so much more exorbitant. Something to think about when, you know, next generation, when housing is too expensive or, you know kids to live in their parents' houses because their parents don't have houses, what's the result? More and more debt. Thus it came about that the French peasant cedes the capitals in the form of interest on the mortgages encumbering the soil and in the, in the form of the interest on the advances made by a user without mortgages, not only on the ground rent, not only on the industrial profit, in a word, not only on the whole net of profit, but even a part of the wages, and that therefore he has sunk to the level of the Irish tenant farmer, all under the pretense of being a private proprietor. Proprietor, excuse me. This process was accelerated in France by the ever-growing burden of taxes, by court costs, called forth in part directly by the formalities with which a French legislation encumbers the ownership of land in part by the innumerable conflicts over parcels everywhere, bounding and crossing each other, in part by legi the litigiousness of the peasants, whose enjoyment of property is limited to the fanatical assertion of their title to their fancied properties, their property rights. According to a statistical statement of 1840, the gross production of French agriculture amounted to five Five billion two hundred thirty-seven thousand million one hundred seventy-eight thousand francs. Of this cost, the cultivation came to three billion five hundred fifty-two million francs, including consumption of the persons working. There remained a net product of one billion six hundred eighty-five million one hundred seventy-eight thousand francs, from which five hundred fifty-five sorry five hundred fifty million had to be deducted for interest on mortgages. 100 million on for law officials, 350 million for taxes, and 107 million for registration money, stamp duty, mortgage fees, etc. There is left one third of the net product, or 538 million, when distributed over the population, not 25 francs per head net production. Footnote. These the figures are not tallied. The tax reads five hundred thirty-eight million instead of five hundred seventy-eight million one hundred seventy-eight thousand. Apparently a misprint. This does not, if however, affect the general conclusion, for the net capita income is less than twenty-five francs in both cases. Naturally, neither usury, outside mortgage, nor lawyers' fees, etc., are included in this calculation. Because, you know, when they're getting fucked like this, they need to hire lawyers in order to defend themselves in the courts. Um, and say this person is, is, um, is, is, um, over extracting to me due to, um, my mortgage. Um, and most people can't do that. The condition of the French peasants, when the Republic has added new burdens to their old ones, is comprehensible. It can be seen that their exploitation differs only in form from the exploitation of the industrial proletariat. The exploiter is the same, capital. The individual capitalists exploit the individual peasants through mortgages and usury. 
The capitalist class exploits the peasant class through the state taxes. The peasant style of property is a talisman by which the capital holds him hitherto under its spell, the pretext under which is set him against the industrial proletariat. Only the fall of capital can raise a peasant. Only an anti-capitalist, a proletarian government, can break his economic misery, his social degradation. The constitutional republic is the dictatorship of his united exploiters. The social democrat, the red republic, is the dictatorship of his allies. And the scale rises or falls according to the votes the peasants cast in the ballot box. He himself has to decide his fate. So spoke the socialists in pamphlets, almanacs, calendars, and leaflets of all kinds. The Lang, this language became more understandable to him through the counter-writings of the Party of Order, which for its part turned to him, and which by gross exaggeration, by its brutal conception and, misrep and representation of the intentions and ideas of the socialists, struck the true present note and overstimulated his lust after forbidden fruit. But most understandable was the language of the actual experience that the peasant class had gained from the use of suffrage, were the disillusionments overwhelming him blow by blow with revolutionary speeds. Revolutions are the locomotives of history. This is an important um, bit right here. Paste that little bit, and we are going to paste this as well. Okay, the gradual revolutionizing of the peasants was manifested by various symptoms. It early revealed itself in the elections to the Legislative Assembly. It was revealed in the stave siege of the five departments bordering Lyons. It was revealed a few months after June 13th in the election of a Montague Montagnard, in place of the former president of the chamber in Trouville, um, the, by the Department of Garande. Um, and there is a footnote, um, note by Ingalls in 19, 1895 edition. This is the name given by history to the fanatically ultra-royalist and reactionary chamber deputies elected immediately after the second overthrow of Napoleon in 1815. Continuing, it was revealed on December 20, 1849, in the election of a red in place of a deceased legitimist deputy in the Department du Gard, the promised land legitimists, the scene of the most frightful infamies committed against the Republicans of 1794 and 95, this centered the white terror in 1815, when liberals and Protestants were publicly murdered. And there's a footnote um, for the deceased legitimist. Um, Lagarde, a supporter of the Mountain Party, was elected to the Legislative Assembly in the by-elections held in the Department of the Gironde on 8, October 14th, 1949, 1849, to replace the deceased right-wing deputy Ravez. This revolutionizing of the most stationary class is most ev clearly evident since the reintroduction of the wine tax. The governmental measures and the laws of January and February 1850 are directly directed almost exclusively against the departments and the peasants, the most striking proof of their progress. The hot pole circular by which the gendarme was appointed inquisitor of the prefect, the subprefect, and above all, of the mayor, and by which espionage was organized in even the hidden corners of the remotest village community, the law against the school teachers, by which they, the men of talent, the spokesmen, the educators, interpreters of the present class, were subjected to the arbitrary power of the prefect. They, the proletarians of the learned class, were chased like hunted beasts from one community to another. The bill against the mayors, by which a Damocles sword of dismissal was hung over their heads, and they, the presence of the peasant communities, were every moment sent opposition to the president of the Republic and the Party of Order. The ordinance which transformed the 17 military districts of France into four pachaliques and forced the barracks and the bivac on the French as their national salon. The education law, by which the Party of Order proclaimed unconsciousness and the forceful, stu forcible stu 
stupefaction of France as a condition of its life under a regime of universal suffrage. What were all these laws and measures? Desperate attempts to reconquer the departments and the peasants of the departments for the party of order. So, and we're seeing that now, right? Assaults on education, assaults on educators. It's a it's an effectively constant thing. And of course, the irony is the obvious results of this are that the educators are like, I'm being very educated on my position on you. But, you know, the educators need to go in there and get organized and recognize their enemies, right? In order to know how to educate people against them. Continuing, regarded as repression, they were wretched methods that wrung the neck of their own purpose. The big measures, like the retention of the wine tax, of the 45 cent me tax, the scornful rejection of peasant petitions for the repayment of the milliard, etc. All these legislative thunderbolts struck the peasant class all at once, wholesale, from the center. The laws and measures side make attack and resistance general. The topic of the day in every hut, they inculcated, inoculated every village with the revolution. They localized and peasantized the revolution. Um, real quick. I just want to pull this over. Okay. On the other hand, do these proposals of Bonaparte and their acceptance by the National Assembly prove the unity of two powers of the Constitutional Republic? So far as is the question of repression of anarchy that is, of all the classes that rise against the bourgeois dictatorship. Did not Soluc Louis Bonaparte, directly after his Bruce message, assure the legislative assembly of his devotion to order through the immediate following message of Carlier, that dirty, mean caricature of Fouché, as Louis Bonaparte himself was a shallow caricature of Napoleon. Uh... There is a footnote here. In his message of November 10, 1849, Carlier, the newly appointed Paris police prefect, called for a social anti-socialist league to be set up for the protection of religion, labor, family, property, and loyalty. Such as was published in Le Moniteur Universel. The education law that show, shows us the alliance of the young Catholics with the old Voltarians. I wonder what Marx had on Voltaire. I don't know much too much about Voltaire. Um, I should know more about him. But Marx very clearly um, was not impressed. Could the rule of the United Bourgeoisie be anything but the coalesced despotism of the pro-Jesuit restoration and the make-believe free-thinking July monarchy? Had not the weapons uh, that the one bourgeois faction had distributed among the people against the other faction in their mutual struggle for supremacy again be torn from it, the people, since the latter was confronting their united dictatorship? Nothing had aroused a pair of shopkeeper more than the Cote coquettish display of Jesuitism and not even the rejection of the friendly agreements. This is interesting. You know, earlier when he was bringing up the Jesuit, he was actually talking in regards to Catholic Church. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is you know, an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate thing of that, uh, period and of Marx. Though I will ask, um, somebody who is more educated on me, uh, Erica, what is content of this exception of Jesuit? As it is brought up a couple of times, including in context of 
Catholic Church. Okay. Um, in the meantime, as we wait for a response there, if it occurs during this session, let's continue reading. Meanwhile, the collisions between the different factions of the Party of Order, as well as between the National Assembly and Bonaparte, continued. The National Assembly was far from pleased at Bonaparte immediately after his coup d'etat. After appointing his own Bonapartist ministry, summoned before him the invalids of the monarchy, newly appointed prefects, and made their unconstitutional agitation for his re-election as president the condition of their appointment. That Carlier celebrated his inauguration with the closing of a legitimist club, or that Bonaparte founded a journal of his own, Le Napoleon, which betrayed the secret longings of the president to the public, while his ministers had to deny them from the tribune of the Legislative Assembly. The latter was far from pleased by the defiant retention of the ministry, notwithstanding its various votes of no confidence, far from pleased by the attempt to win the favor of the non-commissioned officers by an extra pay of four sous a day in favor of proletariat by plagiarism of Eugene Sue's mystery by an honor loan bank. Far from pleased, finally, by the effrontery with which the ministers were made to move the deportation of the remaining June insurgents to Algiers, in order to heap unpopularity of the Legislative Assembly and Gross, while the President reserved popularity for himself in detail by individual grants of pardon, tears that fall threatening words about coup d'etats and coup de têtes, rash act and the Legislative Assembly revenged itself on the Bonapartists by rejecting every proposed law that he put forward for his own benefit, and by inquiring with noisy mistrust in every instance when he made a proposal in the common interest, whether he did not aspire, through increase of the executive power, to augment the personal power of Bonaparte. In a word, it revenged itself by conspiracy of contempt. Um... Was Stalin a, a Jew? Was a Jew? That does that doesn't sound. No, he definitely wasn't. So Stalin Jesuit Church. Wait, does a Jesuit Church exist? Is that a thing? The Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuit Order of the Jesuits. Okay, it is the Catholic Church. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry. I thought that that was in reference to... Gotcha. Okay. That explains things a lot better. Okay. Anyway, um, thank you for that, Luminates. Continuing, the the legitimist party, on its part, saw the with vexation the more incapable Orleanists once more occupying almost all posts and centralization increasing, while it sought its salvation principally in decentralization. And so it was the counter revolution centralized forcibly, that is, it prepared the mechanism of the revolution even centralized the gold and silver of France and the Paris Bank through compulsory quotation of banknotes, and so created the ready war chest of the revolution. Lastly, the Orleanists saw with vexation the emergent principle of legitimacy contrasted with their bastard principle, and themselves every moment snubbed and maltreated as a bourgeois misalliance of a noble spouse. Little by little, we have seen peasants, fey bourgeois, the middle classes in general, stepping alongside the proletariat, driven into open antagonism to the official republic and treated by it as antagonists. Revolt against big bourgeois dictatorship, need of a change of society, adherence to democratic republican institutions as organs of their own movement, grouping around the proletariat as a decisive revolutionary power, these are the common characteristics of the so-called party of social democracy, the party of the red 
republic. This party of anarchy, as its opponents christened it, is no less a coalition of different interests than the party of order. From the smallest reform to the old social order, to the overthrow of the old social order, from bourgeois revol liberalism to revolutionary terrorism, as far apart as this lies the extremes that form the starting point and the finishing point of the party of, quote, anarchy. Um, I'm going to make uh, this wholesale. This is a useful thing. <laughs> the abolition of the protective tariff, socialism, for it strikes at the monopoly of the industrialist faction of the party of order. Regulation of the state budget, socialism, for it strikes at the monopoly of the financial faction of the party of order. Free admission of foreign meat and corn, socialism, for it strikes the monopoly of the third faction of the party of order, large landed property. The demands of the free trade party, that is, of the most advanced English bourgeois party, appear in France as so many socialist demands. Voltairianism, socialism, for it strikes at a fourth faction of the party of order, the Catholic, freedom of the press, right to association, universal public education, socialism, socialism, he struck at the general monopoly of the party of order. Ain't this familiar? <laughs> oh, man. So swiftly had the march of the revolution ripened conditions that the friends of reform of all shades, the most moderate claims of the middle classes, were compelled to group themselves around the banner of the most extreme party of revolution, around the red flag. Yet manifold as the socialism of the different large section of the party of anarchy was, according to the economic conditions and the total revolutionary requirements of the class or faction of a class arising out of these, in one point it is in harmony. In proclaiming itself the means of emancipating the proletariat and the emancipation of the latter as its object, deliberate deception on the part of some, self-deception on the part of others who promote the world transformed according to their own needs as the best world for all as a realization of all revolutionary claims and the elimination of all revolutionary co collisions behind the general socialist phrases of the party of anarchy which sound rather alike there's a conceal there's concealed the socialism of the national of the press of the cls which more or less consistently wants to overthrow the rule to finance aristocracy and to free industry and trade from their hitherto existing fetters. This is the socialism of industry, of trade, and of agriculture, whose bosses in the party of order deny these interests, insofar as no longer coincide with their private monopolies. Petty bourgeois socialism, socialism par excellence, is distinct from this bourgeois socialism, to which as every variety of socialism, sections of the workers and pay bourgeois naturally rally. Capital hounds this class chiefly as its creditor, so it demands credit institutions. Capital crushes it by competition, so it demands associations supported by the state. Capital overwhelms it by concentration, so it demands progressive taxes, limitations on inheritance, taking over large con construction projects of the state, and other measures that forcibly stem the growth of capital. Since it dreams of the peaceful achievement of its socialism, perhaps allowing for a second February revolution lasting a brief day or so, the coming historical process naturally appears to it as an application of systems which the thinkers of society, whether in company or as individual inventors, devise or have devised. Thus, they become the eclectics, or abdects of the existing social systems, the doctrinaire socialism, which was a theoretical expression of the proletariat only as long as they had not yet developed further into a free historical movement of its own. Taking that entire thing, this, this is chock full with good stuff. While this utopian doctrinaire socialism, which subordinates a total movement to one of its stages, which puts in place of common social production to brainwork of individual pedants, and above all, in fantasy does away with the revolutionary struggle of the classes and its requirements by small conjurer's tricks or great sentimentality. 
Whilst its doctrinaire socialism, which at bottom only idealizes present society, takes a picture of it without shadows and wants to achieve its ideal athwart the realities of present society. While the proletariat surrenders its socialism to the petty bourgeois, while the struggle of the different socialist leaders among themselves set forth each of the so-called systems as pretentious adherents to one of the transit points of the social revolutions that is against another, the proletariat rallies more and more around revolutionary socialism, around communism, where the bourgeoisie had itself invented the name of Blanqui. This socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution, the class dictatorship of the proletariat as a necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally, to the abolition of all the relations of production on which they rest, to the abolition of all social relations that correspond to these relations of production, to the revolutionizing of all the ideas that result of these social relations. The scope of this exposition does not permit the developing of the subject further. That is too bad. I would love to hear it developed further. Um, but we are going to take this entire thing and, um, yeah, th this is, this is a great, um, section. Uh, great. Read closely. Okay. I think we've gotten more today than we have in all the previous days to combined. <laughs> but that's okay. We've been building up to this. We have seen that just as a party of order, the finance aristocracy necessarily took the lead. So in the party of anarchy, the proletariat, while the different classes unite in the Revolutionary League, grouped themselves around the proletariat, while the departments became ever more unsafe, and the legislative assembly itself ever more morose towards the pretensions of the French Soluque, the long deferred and delayed by election, the long deferred and delayed by elections of substitutes of the Montagnards prescribed after June 13th drew near. The government, scorned by its foes, maltreated and daily humiliated by its alleged friends, saw only one mean of emerging from this repugnant and untenable position. Revolt. A revolt in Paris would have permitted the proclamation of a state siege in Paris, the departments and thus the control of the elections. On the other hand, Friends of order, in face of a government that had not gained victory over anarchy, were constrained to make concessions if they did not want to appear as anarchists themselves. The government set to work. At the beginning of February 1850, provocation of the people by chopping down the trees of liberty. In vain. If the trees of liberty lost their place, the government itself lost its head and fell back, frightened by its own provocation. The National Assembly, however, mis received this clumsy attempt at the emancipation of the part of Bonaparte with ice-cold mistrust. The removal of the reeds of Immortales from the July calm was no more successful. There is a footnote here. The July calm erected in Paris on the Bastille Square in 1840 in memory of those who fell in the July Revolution of 1830 had been decorated with reeds of Immortales since ever since February Revolution of 1848. What are these reeds? <laughs> it's a quest item from The Witcher. <laughs> okay, I see. It's a funerary wreath. Um, but it isn't this familiar, you know? <laughs> Familiar. We've certainly not seen that one of those in our lifetimes. Absolutely not. It gave part of the army an opportunity for revolutionary demonstrations, and the National Assembly the occasion for a more or less veiled vote of no confidence in the ministry. 
In vain, the government press threatened the abolition of the universal suffrage, the evasion of the Cossacks. In vain was Hunt Pole's direct challenge, issued to the left in the Legislative Assembly itself, to betake itself to the streets, and his declaration that the government was ready to receive it. Hot Pole received nothing but a call to order from the president, and a party of order, with silent malicious joy, allowed a deputy of the left to mock Bonaparte's usurpatory longings. In vain, finally, was a prophecy of a revolution on February 24th. The government caused February 24th to be ignored by the people. The proletariat did not allow itself to be provoked to revolt, because it was on the point of making a revolution. Unhindered by the provocation, so this again is indication of the requirement of a disciplined proletariat, right? All it would have taken was a couple of people, and and this is one of the dangers of like agent provocateurs, right? All it would take is them getting together their right wing militia fuckers, having them dress in plain clothes. Um, maybe cover their faces a little bit and then cause a ruckus. And then they say that's, that's a revolt there. And then they do it themselves. Instead, they decide to, you know, wait for the people to do it. Um, which didn't carry out. You always have to be on the lookout for agent provocateurs. And unfortunately, there's not really much of a way to deal with them. Not really. But. It's only through disciplined working class that you don't have your own people going out and doing this shit. Because they were, in fact... Imagine anarchists today. I guarantee you in these conditions they would go out. I guarantee you. But these people, they were disciplined. They knew what was going on. Unhindered by the provocations of the government, which only heightened the general exacerbation of the existing situation, the election committee, wholly under the influence of the workers, put forward three candidates for Paris, De Flotte, Vidal, and Carnot. De Flotte was a June deportee, amnesty through one of Bonaparte's popularity-seeking ideas. He was a friend of Blanqui and taken part in the attempt of May 15. Vidal, known as a communist writer through the book Concerning the Distribution of Wealth, was formerly secretary to Louis Blanc of the Luxembourg Commission. Carnot, son of the man of the convention who had organized the victory, the least compromised member of the National Party, the Ministry of Education and the Provisional Government and the Executive Commission, was through his Democratic Public Education Bill a living protest against the education law of the Jesuits. These three candidates represented the three allied classes. At the head, the June insurgent, the representative of the revolutionary proletariat. Next him, the doctrinaire socialist, the representative of the socialist pay bourgeoisie. Finally, the third, the representative of the Republican bourgeois party, whose democratic formulas had gained a social significant vis-a-vis -vis the party of order and had long lost their own significance. This was a general co coalition against the bourgeoisie and the government, as in February. But this time, the proletariat was at the head of the Revolutionary League. In spite of all efforts, the socialist candidates won. The army itself voted for the June insurgents against its own war ministry, La Hitt. The party of order was thunderstruck. The election in the departments did not solace them. The departments gave a majority to the Montagnards. The election of March 10, 1850. It was a revolu re revocation of June 1848. The butchers and the deportees of the June insurgents returned to the National Assembly, but returned, bowed down, in the train of the deported, with their principles on their lips. It was a revocation of June 13, 1849. But the Montaigne, prescribed by the National Assembly, returned to the National Assembly, but as advanced trumpeters of the revolution, no longer as its commanders. It was a revocation. December 10th, Napoleon had lost out with his minister Lahit. The parliamentary history of France knows only one analogy, the rejection of de Hauser, minister of Charles X in 1830. Finally, the election of March 10, 1850, was a cancellation of the election of May 13th which had given the party of order a majority. 
The election of March 10 protested against the majority of May 13. March 10 was a revolution. Behind the ballots lie the paving stones. Quote, the vote of March 10 means war, shouted Seigneur Diagasse, one of the most advanced members of the Party of Order. With, with March 10, 1850, the Constitutional Republic entered a new phase, the phase of its dissolution. The different factions of the majority are again united among themselves and with Bonaparte. They are again the saviors of order, and he is again their neutral man. If they remember that they are royalists, it happens only from the despair of the possibility of a bourgeois republic. If he remembers he is a pretender, it only happens because he despairs of remaining president. At the command of the Party of Order, Bonaparte answers the election of de Flot, the June insurgent, by appointing Baroque Minister of Internal Affairs. Baroque, the accuser of Lunky and Barbès, of Lea, Le Drouillin, and Guinard. The Legislative Assembly answers the election of Carnot by adopting the Education Law, the election of Vidal by suppressing the socialist press. The party of order seeks to blare away its own fears by the trumpet blast of its press. The sword is holy, cries one of its organs. The defenders of order must take the offensive against the red party, cries another. Between socialism and society, there's a duel to the death, a war without surcease or mercy. In this duel of desperation, one or the other must go under. If society does not annihilate socialism, socialism will annihilate society, crews the third cock of the order. Throw out the bar barricades of order, the barricades of religion, the barricades of the family, and in must be made of the 127,000 voters of Paris. Bertholomew's night for the socialists, and the party of order believes for a moment in its own certainty of victory. Their organs hold forth most fanatically of all against the, the tradesmen of Paris. A June insurgent of Paris elected by the shopkeepers of Paris as a representative. This means that for a second time, 2nd June, 1848, is impossible. It means that 2nd June 13th, 1849, is impossible. This means that the moral influence of capital is broken. This means that the bourgeois assembly now represents only the bourgeoisie. This means that big property is lost because its vassal, small property, seeks its salvation in the camp of the propertyless. The party of order naturally returns to its inevitable commonplace. More repression, it cries. Tenfold repression. But its power of repression has diminished tenfold, while the resistance has increased a hundredfold. Must not the chief instrument of repression, the army, itself be repressed? And the party of order speaks its last word. The iron ring of suffocating legality must be broken. The constitutional republic is impossible. We must fight with our true weapons. Since February 1848, we have fought the revolution with its weapons and on its terrain. We have accepted its institution. The Constitution is a fortress which safeguards only the besiegers, not the besieged, by smuggling ourselves into holy Ilion in the belly of the Trojan horse. We have, unlike our forefathers, the Greeks, not conquered the Kassau town, but made prisoners of ourselves. And there's a footnote, uh, a play on word, Greeks, but also professional chief. The foundation of the Constitution, however, is universal suffrage. Annihilation of universal suffrage. Such is the last word of the order, party of order, of bourgeois dictatorship. This is a good quote here. On May 4th, 1848, on December 20, 1848, on May 13, 1849, and on July 8th, 1849, universal suffrage admitted that they were right. Uh, footnote. Um, the... On May 4th, 1848, the Constituent Assembly was convened. December 20th, 1848, Louis Bonaparte became president. May 13, 1849, elections were held to the Legislative Assembly. July 8th, 1849, by-elections took place in Paris, as a result of which the Party of Order strengthened its position in the Legislative Assembly. On March 10th, 1850, universal suffrage admitted it had been wrong. In other words, when we win the elections, it's it's correct. When they lose them, it's it's incorrect. <laughs> 
bourgeois rule as the outcome and result of universal suffrage, as had the as the express act of the sovereign will of the people. That is the meaning of the bourgeois constitution. But has the constitution any further meaning from the moment that the content of this suffrage, of the sovereign will, is no longer bourgeois rule? Is it not the duty of the bourgeoisie so to regulate the suffrage that it wills a reasonable its rule? By ever and anon putting it into the existing state power, state power and creating it a new out of itself, does not universal suffrage put an end to all stability? Does it not every moment question all powers that be? Does it not annihilate authority? Does it not threaten to elevate anarchy itself to the position of authority? After March 10th, 1850, who would still doubt it? I'm re reminded of, you know, when you push somebody who supports America far enough on the state of affairs and you're like is america really a democracy and you go through it in depth they will admit it's not a democracy it's a republic right they'll admit it they will recognize they're not a democracy and then the question is well okay you don't live in a democracy what are you gonna do about it the answer is nothing they aren't for democracy. They reject it. <laughs> By repudiating universal suffrage, with which it hitherto draped itself and from which it sucked its omnipotence, the bourgeoisie openly confessed, quote, Our dictatorship has hitherto existed by the will of the people. It must now be consolidated against the will of the people. And consistently, it seeks its props no longer within France, but without in foreign countries an invasion with the invasion the second koblenz uh footnote koblenz is a center of the counter-revolutionary immigrants during the french revolution uh pe people who moved um to flee the french revolution its seat established in france itself roused is all the national passions against itself with the attack on universal suffrage, it provides a general pretext for a new revolution. And a revolution requires such a pretext. Every special pretext would divide the factions of the Revolutionary League and give promise, prominence to their differences. The general pretext stuns the rev semi-revolutionary class, permits them to deceive themselves concerning the definite character of the coming revolution, concerning the consequences of their own act. Every revolution requires a question for discussion at banquets. Universal suffrage is the banquet question of the new revolution. Familiar. And then I'm going to copy that in. The bourgeois factions in coalition, however, are already condemned, since they take flight from the only possible form of their united power from the most potent and complete form of their class rule, the constitutional republic, back to subordinate, completer, weaker form of monarchy. They resemble an, the old man who, in order to regain his youthful strength, fetched out his boyhood garments and suffered being torment, trying to get to his withered limbs into him. Their republic has the sole merit of being the hothouse of the revolution. March 10th, 1850, bears the inscription, Après moi le deluge, after me the deluge. Footnote, words attributed to Louis the 15th. And that's where we're going to leave off for today. We have finally gotten to the last bit. We will certainly finish um, this text tomorrow. We've gotten a ton of very good quotations here. Um, I hope that the recording worked out. Um, and, you know, I appreciate everybody who stuck around. Welcome, by the way, Lost Note 6621888. I hope that you enjoyed the, the latter half of this <laughs> uh, session. I will be posting this on YouTube for who, whatever weirdos actually listen to these. Um, we're working through these. And eventually we will complete the dictatorship of the proletariat analysis from the quotations of Marx and Engels. 
and then I will be trying to get Nick Serino, who has been doing a rather intense study on uh, organization of um, and revolutionary construction to uh, come in here and perhaps read excerpts or something along those lines or provide me with something. Because, you know, we've done the communist Marx and Engels on the character of the communist mode of production. Then we're we're doing Marx and Engels on the character of the dictators of the proletariat. Then we'll go into the process of establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat and how we might organize to do such a thing. And then, I guess, because we're going backwards for everything, we'll probably do an intense study on the nature of capital and the capitalist mode of production. Um, we never actually finished the text talk series on um, on the three um, volumes of Capital. We got to video eight, I believe. I highly recommend everybody else pick up watching that. I am not going to be playing that anymore because of stuff. But uh, seriously, if you haven't finished those, you absolutely should. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to sign out um, of our recording. Thank you, everybody, for attending.